You're listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. If you feel awkward or anxious in social situations, visit quietbegins.com and check out the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. Start enjoying life again. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about in this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. You know, I talk a lot about my past, my history, and my dysfunction, my dysfunctional childhood, Um, some abusive behavior by my stepfather, and all kinds of things that try to maybe relate to what you're going through. And uh, not that we've all experienced highly dysfunctional relationships or family when we were growing up, but um, we can look at relationships today and how we show up in the relationship, how those relationships affect us, what emotional triggers come up for us, and uh, what can we do about those emotional triggers? Do we take our triggers out on someone else? If um, somebody causes us to feel angry about something, you know, they do something and it triggers our anger, do we take that anger out on them, or do we look inside and go, hmm, That is a violation of my values and my boundaries, but it's not necessarily them doing that to me. It's just the way they're being in that moment. And to come to the conscientiousness and the very present state of mind to turn back and look inward or turn it around or reverse it and look inward at yourself instead of pointing the finger at someone else I believe, A, it's very challenging, um, but B, once you do that, it's very evolved. And that might be the wrong choice of words, but I don't care. I think when you are able to look inward and figure out that something bothers you that somebody else is doing, and you take responsibility for the emotion that you're having, or for the feelings or the thoughts that you're having, it's an evolved state of mind. It's an evolved emotional state. Now, I've said in the past that some people can cause us to feel certain emotions, especially when they are manipulative or controlling, emotionally abusive, in any way trying to make you feel a certain way uh, so that you uh, fall under their control in some way, so that you do what they want you to do. And I have some opposition to that. Some people will disagree. Well, nobody can control your emotions. Only you can. And I get it. I mean, I get that concept. I understand it. And I don't agree with it. I still believe that people can manipulate you into feeling the way they want you to feel. And yes, you have control. But if you trust the person and love the person and you really believe in them, You're going to believe in them so much that you believe that is the path to take and then suddenly you feel like crap or you feel bad about yourself or you feel like you can't trust your own decisions. I mean, that's the whole emotional abuse cycle that I talk about on my other show, Love and Abuse. But when we have someone in our life that wants to control us, they know our emotional triggers. They know our buttons. They know our history. They can pull things up. They know our vulnerabilities. They can pull things up and use those things against us. It's funny. I just had a conversation on Facebook. Uh, I was regarding one of my posts on how compassionate people, this was also for the love and abuse, how compassionate people can be taken advantage of because they're compassionate. 
And this person wrote and said, what are you saying? You know, compassion is a saintly thing, or I forget how we worded it. Uh, it shouldn't be a bad thing. And I came back and said, I totally agree. I, I think compassion is the most wonderful thing that we have on this planet. Um, and it can be used against you. And he didn't seem to really agree with me or he just didn't understand. So he, he really drilled in and tried to figure out what I meant. And he's asking, well, do you, what do you mean? Are you just saying that mean people suck? <laughs> I said, well, I'm thinking in my head, yes, mean people do suck, but that's not exactly what I'm saying here. And I went on to explain that sometimes our compassion for people can be used against us and we turn into victims because we are so compassionate. And, you know, a good example is when there is abuse going on in a relationship and the person being abused has so much compassion for the abuser's history that the victim looks past his or her own mental and physical health and well-being because they're so compassionate. It's when you turn off the self-compassion and keep on the outer compassion for others that can cause danger. I wholly believe self-compassion has to come first. It has to. Otherwise, you're not going to have any left for anyone else. You may think you do. I mean, that's what typically happens is that some people are so compassionate, they're selfless. In other words, they're doing things for other people because they are compassionate for them. And I get that. There are selfless people out there. But I don't agree when you're not self-compassionate. In other words, if you don't have compassion for yourself while you are being compassionate for others, I don't believe the compassion that you have for others is, how can I say this, all that it can be? real. I'm treading a thin line here. I'm on thin ice because, uh, you know, selfless compassion, I believe, is a thing. I just think that we define selfless wrong. I think when you show up in someone's life and you show selfless compassion, it is not because you don't care about yourself, or at least this is my definition. It is not because you don't care about yourself and you don't care about your health and well-being. But it is because you care about them and their health and well-being. Now, that has an inclusionary clause, <laughs> if I may say that, of it's not that I don't care about myself, which implies I care about myself. And as long as I continue to be healthy and have a good mental and physical state here, then I can continue showing you compassion. If that declines or is diminished or damaged even by the other person I'm showing compassion to, then suddenly I don't have as much to give. And am I then really giving from a place of compassion? And I think that is, in my mind, the most important question. If I am compassionate toward another person, am I A, compassionate to myself first? And if I am, then I believe I am showing the truest, most authentic form of compassion I can because it's coming from a place of compassion. However, if I'm not compassionate toward myself, meaning if I know that someone else is hurting me or, or trying to hurt me or very toxic and I choose to stay around that person or be near that person and be affected by that person, Am I really showing myself compassion? Am I really showing myself that I care about me? And that is one of the most important aspects of any relationship. It's not so much that you care about the other person. That is a vital part of it. It's that you care about yourself first. You have to care about yourself. If you don't care about yourself, then what kind of care can you possibly show to someone else? If you don't love yourself, how can you love someone else? If you don't uh, respect yourself, how can you respect someone else? I mean, we've heard things like this before, but I, I think it really needs to sink into our psyche, our emotional core, that how can we really know how to love someone else if we haven't shown that same love, respect, kindness, generosity, caring, 
to ourselves. Again, this is kind of the basics that we've heard before. You must love yourself. You must be compassionate towards yourself. I get it. Or maybe you haven't heard this. If you haven't heard this, then soak it in. I mean, I really want you to love yourself. This isn't an ego trip. I really want you to care about yourself so that you don't become a victim to your own treatment of yourself. And your own treatment could be you're in a situation that somebody else is mistreating you and you choose to continue to stay in that mistreatment. You choose to continue to stay around that toxic behavior or at least not address it in a very self-loving way. And what I mean by that is it is healthy to address someone else's toxic behavior in a way that shows that you love you. It's just like if you have a child and someone is mistreating that child, you're going to show that protective love that most parents would show when it comes to protecting that child. It's, it's that kind of thought and feeling that you have when you know that somebody not only can't help themselves, but doesn't deserve the treatment they're getting. And that's your child. I mean, that's for most people is there's nothing more important in the world than their child. And they'll do anything to protect that child. I look at that as self-love too. You are your own child. It's that inner child that is still in there that has those old emotional triggers that has all the thoughts and feelings that they had when they were four and six and 10 and 16 and 28. It's the younger version of you that continues to learn as if they were a child in this world, continues to heal through some of the childhood wounds and the traumas and the hurts and the toxic relationships that you've had in the past. It's that child that shows up in the world as an adult, as the person you are today. I mean, if you're an adult listening to this, uh, but even if you're a child now, this is really good information because what you're experiencing today is the culmination of how you've shown up for the past X number of years that you've been alive. It's what you've learned over your life and everything that you've healed from and everything that you haven't healed from. Everything that you have learned about yourself and others and how you've changed and how you haven't changed. And I think um, one of the things that we can look at in our lives is how haven't I changed? And that's hard to do sometimes because sometimes we don't realize that we're in, I don't want to say a bad situation, but maybe in, uh, we could be in a better situation. Like you could be in a relationship, you could be in um, a family environment or a work environment, some sort of environment or group of people or a person that could be harmful to you and you wouldn't even know it because you don't realize it's harmful. You don't realize the behavior that you're experiencing is harmful. And the reason that happens is is because you grew up in that type of environment probably, or you grew up to be somehow resilient or resistant. You grew up in a way to respond to bad, bad behavior that wasn't healthy for you. In other words, when somebody tries to harm you or abuse you or hurt you or say something mean to you, that you don't stand up for yourself because you were told not to stand up to anyone or standing up to someone, a parental figure of some sort resulted in a bad outcome. And because it resulted in the bad outcome, you never want to do it again. I don't want to get yelled at. I don't want to get hit. I don't want to get punished. I don't want discipline. So I'm not going to speak up for myself. And we need to learn to reverse that if it's happening. If you experience this in your life where you don't feel comfortable enough to stand up for yourself, Self-love, self-compassion, self-respect, self-care, all of that. If you don't feel that, how can you put that out into the world? I'm not saying you can't. I'm not saying that if you don't have this, you aren't doing it. I'm saying to be very aware of it. I'm saying to be very conscientious of it. Because if you aren't, you may bypass the number one person in your life, you. You may overlook the problems in your life because you care so much about other people. 
I'm not saying it's a fault. I don't want you to think that's a fault. I don't want you to think that I'm telling you not to care about other people. I Absolutely. I think compassion is how we get along in the world, is how we take care of each other in the world. I mean, this is a lot more to it, but compassion is a, a, a wonderful quality to have along with empathy and sympathy. Those qualities are wonderful to have. It's how we continue to, to learn and grow together and make friends and have relationships and really feel good being around other people when we have these qualities and those qualities come back to us as well. When they don't come back to us, now is that healthy for us? So this is where you look inward and you ask yourself, am I being treated with compassion and care and love and kindness and respect and are people treating me well in general? Well, how are they treating you and do you need to speak up? And say, look, I don't appreciate being treated that way. Because that's what might need to happen. And I know I know this, and I'm, I'm going to say it. A lot of people listen to this show. Maybe not you, but there's a lot of people that listen to this show that just can't stand up for themselves. They just can't say that thing that they want to say. They just can't say it. They just can't say, look, you need to back off because the way you're treating me now is very hurtful and I don't appreciate it. So you need to back off. I want you to be able to say that when you need to. I want you to be able to say that because when you start doing that for yourself, you suddenly start feeling differently about yourself. If you have had any negative inner dialogue going on, you know, I'm so stupid, I am i can't stand the way I look, I can't stand how much I weigh, I, uh, I'm no good, I'm whatever. If you have any of that negative inner dialogue going on, that starts to change when you stand up for yourself. That starts to change when you start to actually act on compassion for yourself. Your life is a lot different when you show up in the world as being proud of who you are, when you show up in the world being self-loving, self-compassionate, self-respecting, and letting others know when they've crossed your boundary or violated a value. Doesn't mean you show up as this mean person that says, get the heck out of my way, you're crossing my line, you're crossing my boundary. It just means that you love yourself enough to let other people know that when they're hurting you in some way, you aren't afraid to say, this is what you're doing and I don't appreciate it. Now, what stops us from doing that when we don't do it is because we're afraid to hurt someone else or we're afraid that they might leave us or fire us or divorce us. They might do something that leaves us lonely or looking for another job or without family because family is all we have. We, you know, we think we're going to lose something. So I want you to remember that if you ever feel like you're going to lose something by standing up for yourself, by being self-compassionate, that if you are replacing self-compassion with something that you're afraid of losing, then you're going to lose a lot more than what you're afraid of losing. And it all comes back to you. If you are so afraid of losing something in your life to the point that you won't show yourself compassion and stand up for yourself just so they won't do X, Y, Z, so they won't leave you, so they won't fire you, so they won't divorce you, so they won't excommunicate you from the church, so they won't excommunicate you from the family, whatever it is. If you are not with people that don't want you to honor yourself, that don't want you to show yourself compassion, then you're probably not with the right people. I know I'm on thin ice, like I said, but I want you to keep this in mind and just develop the philosophy. Just develop the idea of this thing I'm talking about, about self-compassion. Just so you're not the doormat just so that you know that you are also as important as other people. In fact, you are more important than other people. Yes, we, we might be talking about ego here, but you have to remember a healthy ego where you actually do take pride in who you are, that you actually do care about yourself, and you even pump yourself up and give yourself credit 
doesn't mean you're showing off. It just means the inner dialogue changes. It just means it goes from negative to positive. It just means that when you show up in the world as something that you're really proud of and it is a compassionate, self-loving place. And once you gain this concept, once you really start wearing this around, you'll notice more often when people don't want you to feel that way about yourself. You'll notice more often when other people have a different agenda for you because they're, they're going to do things that cause you to not feel that way about yourself, to not show yourself compassion, to actually somehow hurt yourself in order to show them love or compassion. And if you are in any state of hurt, or maybe that's not the word, um, degradation of self-compassion, or in order to be kind to someone else, you have to be unkind to yourself. If someone encourages you to do that, then you really have to question who you're with, and you really have to question their motives. I'm not saying that they're a bad person. I'm just saying that the conversation might have to take place. So wait a minute, you really want me to hurt myself in order for you to be happy. You really want me to feel bad about myself in order for you to feel good about yourself. That doesn't make any sense to me. Can you please explain that to me? I mean, this is the kind of conversation I would pull up, but I know it takes some time to get there. You have to take the steps to get into a place where you feel like you can honor yourself, where you feel like you can be self-compassionate and self-loving and self-respecting. Hopefully you already are this. Hopefully I'm talking to you and you're already there. But there are times when we need to be there. There are times when we're going to meet that toxic person after we've not been with them for a while, or maybe we see them every day, but we're going to meet up with them soon enough, and they're going to say something that causes us to feel, ugh, we don't like that. And then we'll have a choice. Should I say anything? Well, if I say anything, then he'll start treating my kids badly. Or if I say anything, then she'll yell and scream, and I just don't want to deal with that. If I say anything, then he'll fire me. If I say anything, then maybe she'll want a divorce. You know, all of these thoughts come up. Instead of the right thought that needs to come up, in my opinion, the right thought is, what do I need to do to show myself compassion in this moment? Because if I were my own kid, how would I show up then? Or maybe that's not even compelling enough for you. Some people don't find that compelling enough. I like to look at it as, what do I want to walk away with? Do I want to walk away with my dignity, with my integrity? Do I want to walk away as this person that I've worked on for so long, so hard to get to the point where I am today and be anything less than that? I've had many situations in my life just in the past 10 years that have tested me over and over again. And this will happen. <laughs> once you are ready, once you have gotten to this point where you say, you know what? I am going to be self-compassionate. I am going to show myself compassion. I'm going to show myself love. And the next time this person says this to me, I'm going to speak up. It's going to happen. You're going to be tested and it's going to be scary. I'm not going to lie to you. Some of these tests were the scariest things that I've had to go through. Having to stand up to the person that I saw as my stepfather and sometimes considered my real father for many, many years, very often, um, I had to stand up to him in my 40s for the first time ever in my life. And I cannot convey how scary that was. If you've done this, you know what I'm talking about. It is scary. But you have no idea what that does for your self-esteem, your self-worth, and especially your self-love and self-compassion and self-respect, and even a little bit of ego, self-admiration, like, damn, I did it. <laughs> I really did it. I can't believe it. And especially self-trust, because the trust builds as you pass these challenges that come up. You actually realize that you can do it. You can actually do it. And you did it once, that means you can do it again. I trust that I can do it again. And then when someone crosses my path a year from now, I did it before, I trust that I can get through this. And if you've been listening a while, you've heard me say every time I have tested a challenge, and I just consider a challenge 
uh, someone trying to violate a boundary or a value of mine, um, someone trying to cross my line in some way. Every time I have stood up for myself, it has turned out the exact opposite of what I expected and has made me so much more confident in myself. You know, I talk about the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. Um, that program, I did the survey and like 278 people responded and most of them just wanted to feel more confident. You know, there's a lot of other responses, but just wanted to feel more confident. And this is one of the paths to more confidence. And it is not easy. I am telling you now, I'm like I said, I'm going to be honest about this. It is not easy, but it is absolutely probable and you can do this. And it does take a certain amount of risk, but not usually actual risk. It's a risk that you create in yourself. Like if I do this, I will lose this. And I have learned, and I'm not telling you this as advice. I'm just sharing my own history here and my own, my own examples. I have learned that when I am willing to risk the loss, I gain so much more. And I may lose a relationship, a job, or something else. But I gain so much that I can take with me into any other relationship or job or something else. I get so much more out of it. And the biggest part is I also lose any of the emotional triggers, any of the fears. Uh, if I don't lose them, they decrease significantly. And not having to carry those around changes your life. Your life completely changes. I know it's scary, but if you really want to make some big changes in your life, I highly recommend you take these challenges that come up and show yourself love, respect, care, protection, and above all, compassion. We'll be right back. All right, just a quick message about the safe empowerment system for social anxiety over at quietbegins.com. This system is about seven hours of very transformational healing and moving through and overcoming social anxiety. It's all audio with one workbook and the audios are segmented into what I call emergency pods and learning pods. And the emergency pods are four to six minutes long and they're designed when you start experiencing anxiety. You just put your earphones on and have someone walk you through and out of it. I do a few of them, and we also have other social anxiety experts that do their versions as well. And they're really potent. They're really powerful. And it's so nice to have someone in your ear when this is happening, as if you were on the phone with them and they're walking you through it so that you don't have to deal with it alone. Because social anxiety, it can feel so alone. And so the emergency pods are kind of the highlight of the system. Uh, but there's also the learning pods, which are what you listen to when you're not in that anxious state. And there's so much good information here that you're going to learn from people that have had severe social anxiety. Some of them had severe social anxiety themselves. Uh, not only will you hear from them and what they did to diminish or even cure their own anxiety, but um, they have uh, some very effective techniques and very unique techniques. They're all different. And that's what I love about this system is that everyone shares a different angle. And you're going to resonate with some more than others, but it will all be helpful. And so the system is set up, like I said, it's a combination of different types of audio elements. It's got meditation elements. It's got hypnotic subconscious elements. And of course, the conscious, rational, problem-solving, practical elements as well so that you can really apply what you've learned. So it, it, it tackles anxiety both from the subconscious and the conscious level. That's what makes this system unique. And that's why it's going to help you overcome your social anxiety. So I really believe in this. This is something I've worked on for a long time, several months, day and night, just to make the most powerful system I can on tackling and overcoming social anxiety. So if you are experiencing social anxiety at all, head over to quietbegins.com and check it out. Maybe it's something that will help you as well. 
And um, for 2019, there are 10 more emergency pods uh, that are going to be released. So anyone who's purchased the system will receive those as well. 10 emergency pods come with the system now, and I think there's like eight learning pods. Uh, but there are going to be 10 more emergency pods. And like I said, those are the ones that you turn on as soon as you start feeling it coming on, or if you're in the middle of it, you just slip away, put your earphones in, and have someone walk you through and hopefully even out of it completely. That's the goal. That's what I want for you. The safe empowerment system for social anxiety at quietbegins.com. All right, welcome back. Speaking of somebody doing something that you may not like, I have an email here I'm going to read by someone who is married to a wonderful, caring man. I'm going to call this person my default Jill. Jill says, we've been married for a few years, and just in the last year, he's been smoking pot to ease his anxiety about some of the troubles in the relationship, sometimes every day. I have expressed to him concern about a dependency on it, and I know that this is a trigger for me. Sometimes I feel pushed away by it or like life isn't any good for him without it. In the beginning of our relationship, there was never an issue because he didn't smoke it regularly. But now he's smoking it consistently. It really irks me and triggers me. I understand that uh, me trying to control what he does is not productive for either of us. And I do express to him my own feelings of how his actions bring out this anxiety and discontent in me when I'm feeling triggered. It's so weird because when he feels triggered or anxious, he smokes pot and then in turn causes me to feel triggered and anxious and the cycle spins. I'm working on figuring out for myself why this is a trigger so I can move past it. I did not grow up in a household where a family member was an addict, so it's hard for me to understand where this comes from. I do my best to express my own feelings without blaming or criticizing him. I can go a couple of weeks or a month and sometimes be patient and not let it bother me. But then there are other times they just get these gut feelings of severe sadness and anxiety when I know that he is using a substance to get through his days. Knowing that his use is caused by some of our stresses in the relationship or not doesn't matter. If I knew that he used a substance every day when we were dating, I probably wouldn't have dated him. It's as if it goes against a value of mine, but it is also seen as a medicine and helps him feel better, and I feel really conflicted. I love him, and I don't want to keep getting these awful feelings and cause more tension in our relationship. I'm wondering if you can help guide me to peace in this situation. I'm really grateful I found you as a resource. Okay, thank you, Jill. And um, if anyone remembers, I did an episode on a partner that uh, smoked pot and how that person can, you know, look at it, ask themselves questions about it and what to do about it. And so that might be an episode that you want to look up, Jill. In fact, uh, let me look it up now. Oh, that was um, an episode called Finding Your True Path So You Don't End Up Living a False Life. And in that uh, episode, I read a message from someone that was dating someone that uh, was doing a lot of marijuana. So you may want to look that up if you go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and just type in the search bar at the top right, finding your true path, and it'll pop right up. It'll be the first one. But in there, I think one of the questions I asked the uh, person who wrote the email to ask himself was, if this person never stopped smoking ever, would that be okay with you? Would you come to an acceptance of it? Would you be okay seeing it, smelling it all the time uh, if that were the case? And that's the first thing I'm going to ask you, Jill, is if your husband was never going to change, if he was always going to smoke it every single day for the rest of your lives together, would you be okay with that? I think I know your answer because you're already not okay with it the way it is. And if that's the case, if the answer is no, I wouldn't be okay with it, then my next question is knowing that he will never stop, what are you going to do about it? Because that's the question, right? Well, that's what I'm asking you, Paul. I don't know what to do about it. Well, let's just say that it was just you and him, no one else to ask, what would you do about it? Because eventually you're going to get to the point where you're so fed up that you're going to have to do something. Otherwise, you'll have to live with these little things that are happening inside of you, your, your resistance, your anxiety, whatever it is, when this is happening inside of you, it's hard to live with that. So my first piece of advice is find that episode and listen to it. And you're going to hear me ask that question or something similar 
just so you understand where you'll be if this never stops. You just have to assume it will never stop. All right, so now that we got that part out of the way, I'm going to tie this into the last segment in a minute. (laughs) But yes, I think you're right about values. Let's just say that it's against your value. My question is, what is the value? Is it a relationship value where you say, well, I must have a partner that doesn't smoke pot every day, but he can smoke it every third day. What is the value? I want you to define that value really clear. You might start off by saying, well, I I don't want him to smoke every day. Well, why? Well, and here's where we get to the deeper stuff. Why don't I want him to smoke it? Well, it bothers me. I don't like the smell. Or it bothers me because he's taking a substance. He's altering his brain. And when he alters his brain, he's kind of distant and he doesn't seem like the uh, same person. There might be something to that. Might be a little bit of what I just said in there. Or how about something even deeper? Like, uh, when he's smoking that, it's taking time away from us. It's taking time away from me. It could be some of that. How about when he's getting high, instead of sharing his concerns or his worries or expressing things to me that he normally would, he just smokes them away. And I never know what's going on in his head because he just takes care of it by himself on his own. So that could be it. Maybe you're with someone who never shares anything because all he has to do is light something up and his worries go away. That could be it too. Maybe that's not the kind of relationship you want. I don't know. But this is definitely something you want to figure out why it bothers you so much. And that was your question. Like, I'm not sure why it bothers me so much, but something about this is really bothering you clearly. So If this is the way he was when you met and he's now suddenly become more involved with it, I'd like to ask the first question, when did it start? When did he start becoming more involved with it? When did he start making it more um, daily? And what was going on at that time? Because there's probably a correlation there that you can make that will help you understand what's going on there. And I'm not discounting any type of addiction that might be going on as well. He could have a physical addiction and there's, you know, there's emotional aspects of that too, of course. But if there's a physical addiction, then certainly that's a different set of variables. But from what you're making it out to be, it almost sounds as if he needs to do it because there's stress in the relationship. And that's his way of coping with the stress. You know, if I were in your position The first thing that comes to my mind is why isn't this person sharing with me instead of going off on their own and burning those emotions away through smoking? Why isn't this person wanting to relate to me? It feels like my partner's partner is a joint. It feels like when I want to connect with my partner, my partner wants to connect with that. And so this is where I'm going and how I'm going to tie it in to the last segment, is there's something that's not being fulfilled in you. There's something that's being taken away from you when he's doing this. Because you probably wouldn't feel the way you feel if something wasn't being taken away. So I need you to get really clear about what is being taken away from you. Because once you understand the loss that's happening inside of you, What are you losing? Then you'll understand where your anxiety is coming from and what is going on and why you have a problem with it so much. Because I'm going to say this and I might be wrong. I guarantee you that if he smoked every day and you experienced no loss of whatever that is, you'd probably have no issue with it whatsoever because you already accepted that he smokes marijuana. You already accepted it at the beginning of the relationship. There's already a level of acceptance there and it was okay with you, probably because there was no loss. Now you have loss of some sort. So you need to figure out what you're missing. What is lost? It could be something as simple as quality time. Like he comes home from work, he smokes pot and I don't see him for the rest of the night because he's high and he's hard to talk to and I just have no quality time with him. So that's important to know is what you are losing what have you, what you have lost because once you know that that's what you need to focus on don't focus on the behavior that's replacing what's lost 
focus on what's lost in you. This is what's lost in me. I have less quality time with you. I sit alone in the living room by myself and I feel like I can't connect with you. When you're able to focus on what you're losing and you can convey what you want more of without bringing up what's stopping you from getting more of that, you know, if you weren't smoking pot, then I would have more of this. Just take pot out of the equation. Take that out of it and just speak about what you want more of, regardless of how frequent his smoking is. Say what you want more of, because that is going to define your relationship from that point on instead of my old lady keeps nagging about how much pot I smoke. I'm being a little satirical here, but I'm sure there's some sense of that going on because you know as well as I do, the more grief you give about someone else's behavior, the more likely they'll probably do that behavior just because you don't want them to and they feel like a sense of their individuality is being taken away or trying to be taken away. And that's tough. If somebody came up to you and said, look, I don't want you to, whatever you do, eat ice cream. I don't want you to ever eat ice cream. It really bothers me when you eat ice cream. Then you're going to feel like you're restricted, like you're in some sort of prison system and they restrict what you can do. And when you have that in a relationship, that's tough. That's when deterioration starts and the erosion of love begins. And then suddenly You're two strangers that are roommates in the same house, and that's no fun. So focusing on the problem or what you believe the problem is to be is not the way to do this. Focusing on what you feel is missing or is lost is the way. And tying this into the last segment, that is self-compassion. What am I missing from this? What about this do I feel is hurting me in some way? Because you could be missing just the quality talks that you used to have. Well, let's just say it's that. Let's just use that as an example. We used to talk for an hour or two every day. and It was wonderful. And now he smokes pot. And so now in your mind, pot smoking has taken over the quality talk time. Instead of saying, hey, could you smoke pot less so we can talk more? Forget the pot part and just say, I would like some more quality time talking together. Can we do that? then he'll have a choice on where to spend his time. And he won't have to deal with your resistance about what he needs to do or not do. He might spend more time and energy in his head defending himself and trying to figure out how he can protect this individual thing that he does for himself normally if you are resistant to his smoking. But because you're focusing on being compassionate to yourself, on focusing on what's lost, what's being taken away from you, what's being drained from you, then you can come from that place and say, I would really like some more quality time talking. I would really like us to have a movie night. I would really like us to whatever it is. And then if you were able to do that and he, were, he was able to meet you there and fulfill whatever was missing, my next question you might already know. If he smoked every day and you didn't have the loss or those losses, would it matter so much that he was smoking every day? Now, if you still say, yes, it would, then you have another issue going on. Yes, but it still comes down to loss. I mean, I'm going to just take a wild guess that I'm 100% right, (laughs) that it's coming down to loss because you might think, well, If he smokes every day, his brain will get fried and I'll have no more intellectual conversations with him because it'll be like talking to uh, the stoners I used to see in high school. (laughs) And, you know, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone that uses marijuana, but um, I think we all remember the the quote stoners in high school. They were just like, hey, man. (laughs) And I'm not saying they weren't intelligent either. They were just a little bit more relaxed than the rest of us. And you may feel that maybe you can't communicate in the way you used to communicate with him in the past. Maybe you appreciated more intellectual talk. Maybe you didn't like to talk about marijuana 95% of the time. And maybe you don't like to see the marijuana t-shirts and the marijuana belt buckles and (laughs) whatever it is. I I don't mean to laugh, but uh, you get my point is you have to figure out, okay, if, if all of that is going on, then what am I losing? What are the losses? You could be afraid that you are are losing quality conversation. You could be afraid that you're losing his health. 
And if he loses his health and then loses his life or gets into more drugs or whatever, then what does that mean for your relationship? You could have a fear of losing your relationship. And if that's the case, then you need to be more present-minded today. Because this is the tough part, I know. Uh, when you think about, oh, my partner's doing something that will destroy his life in 20, 20 years or whatever, 10 years, doesn't matter. My partner's doing something that's going to destroy his life. Just like if he started drinking 10 sodas a day, he's going to be a diabetic in two years. I know it. I know it. But is he showing up in a way that is fulfilling and good for you without you losing anything today? So that's what you focus on today. He's still going to make his own choices and you're going to disagree with some of his choices in life, but he's still an individual. He could be with you or not with you and still smoke every day and still do his own thing and be happy as a pig in you know what. He could be absolutely fine doing what he's doing and he could have a happy life too, either way. So we want to help our partners be their individual selves, absolutely, We also want to convey to our partners or anyone in our life that is important to us what we would like more of because there's some sense of loss or because we do want or need more of something without trying to point out what they're doing wrong. And that's really what it comes down to. How can I convey to you what I want from you without pointing out everything that you're doing wrong? Because once we do that, they go into self-defense mode. You know, talking about defending yourself, right? They want to defend themselves. They want to be self-compassionate because they don't want to be told what to do or what not to do. After all, I'm I'm not 10 years old anymore. I'm an adult. Yeah, but you're making childish decisions. Yes, but I've gotten this far in life. I'm an adult. I can handle myself with or without you. I'd rather do it with you, but I'm not defending you or him or anyone here. I'm just saying these are the kind of arguments that are going to come up and it can be offensive to some people. Some people might get offended that you're telling them what to do with their life or their time. But if you're in a relationship and you feel something is being taken away, that's all I'm saying. Focus on that. That's where you need to be. That is self-compassion. That is self-love. And when you come from this place, then you're able to convey it in a way that will give the, the other person the opportunity to fulfill those needs instead of having to feel like they have to do something which they're going to be very resistant of just to make you happy, which they eventually build resentment. Well, I had to stop smoking because my wife said this and my wife said that and she'd leave me if I didn't stop smoking. And you don't want that kind of resentment in there. You just want to convey what you need or need more of so that the person in your life has an opportunity to make that happen. He may or may not be able to do it. I don't know. But if you convey what you need, what you feel like might be lost or not enough of, at least it empowers him instead of makes him feel like his own free will or choices are being taken away. It's giving him more choices, really what it comes down to. You give someone more choices by approaching it that way. Anyway, hope this helps. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll be right back and I'll say my final words after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. Head over to quietbegins.com if you experience social anxiety and you just want to start living life again with more confidence, more security, and not so much fear. I want you to have that. I want you to have it all. Quietbegins.com, the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. I want to thank the patron members over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. There are people in there that have been supporting the show for years. And without them, you wouldn't be able to hear this show, quite literally. Their support means a lot to me just because I'm honored that they would give. Some give more than others, and others give what they can. If you're a patron supporter, it means a lot to me that you do that. And um, quite frankly, it keeps the show on the air. So that's what I use to fund this show. That's why I keep it free. And I want to continue this as long as humanly possible 
So if you find value in this show and you want to help support it as well, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. That's P-A-T-R-O-N dot theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And thank you, existing patron members. I appreciate you. And I want to remind you about the Love and Abuse podcast over at loveandabuse.com. It's based on the mean workbook on emotional abuse and manipulation for those of you in what we might call difficult relationships. I've created a podcast called Love and Abuse. You can find that in your favorite podcast player. And we have like uh, 16 episodes so far. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely do check it out. It is the podcast about poisonous communication and toxic behavior. And I try to cover a lot of things over there. It is based on the mean workbook, but you don't need the mean workbook to follow along because it is basically for anyone who's experienced bad behavior or manipulation or any type of mistreatment. And you just want to figure out what's going on, how to get through it, how to get out of it, what to do. That's the show to listen to. Love and abuse. And also check out the mean workbook. If you're having issues in your relationship and you want to pinpoint exactly what's going on, if you are pulling your hair out and you just can't figure out how to make the relationship work, maybe there's something more going on. Go to loveandabuse.com and check out the Mean mean Workbook today. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And it's funny, I started uh, this episode thinking that I was going to talk about my upbringing a little bit and how um, there's there's a few people in my family that did drugs. And um, that really bothered me as a kid. You know, I would see some very close family members uh, snort and smoke and do all kinds of things that um, I didn't really appreciate because it's not that I had anything against drugs at the time. I mean, I wasn't a drug user. I'm, I'm probably the most square person on the planet. I've had one hit of marijuana at 14, and that was because my dad gave me his bong. (laughs) <laughs> and he said, here you go, son, try it out. And uh, I didn't know any better. And I was like, okay. And I puffed up my cheeks, blew it out and didn't know what the hubbub was about and never did it again. Uh, it was just something I didn't, I, you know, uh, I didn't inhale. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know what to do or how to do it, but um, it just never interested me. Plus, because of my childhood growing up and seeing so many family members in altered states of consciousness, uh, it kind of frightened me. It was a little scary to me seeing the people I loved and trusted and uh, depended on sometimes as completely different people that I was afraid to be around. I mean, especially like my stepfather who drank. And like I said, I'm not saying that uh, drugs are bad or you shouldn't do them. I'm just kind of giving you my perspective of growing up and how even though I was totally against them for a long time, anyone who did drugs I didn't want to associate with, I don't want to be around. That's who I was for a long time until I realized, wait, everyone's an individual. They can make their own choices. Why does it bother me so much? And I had to dig into my past. And this is why I'm telling you this is for the email I read from Jill. Jill, you know, you dug into your past and you said there were no addicts and it wasn't really a problem. That's why I kind of went in the direction that uh, I I did with you. Because if drugs weren't in your past, then that points even more to something that you're missing today. Something that you're losing today or there's a loss of some sort. Which is why I said to focus on that. But what if it is a trigger? What if it is, I mean, not with you, Jill, but anyone listening. What if it's a trigger from your past that when you see someone doing something that used to bother you or still bothers you because of something that happened in your past, then that is something that you need to look at in yourself and figure out, well, why does it bother me so much? And I revealed to you just now why drugs used to bother me so much. It's because the people I loved most and the people I depended on and the people I trusted were in altered states of mind. And they were strangers to me. They were suddenly strangers. And here I am, this really, really young teenager around all these strangers, wondering where the hell did my family go? They disappeared. And it was scary. It was really scary to see the people I knew for so long in suddenly altered states. It's not like they hurt me in these altered states. But again, it was just scary. 
I didn't like seeing it. And so I developed a, a severe aversion to drugs and became very square, wouldn't drink for a long time, and uh, eventually introduced alcohol into my life. And that was enjoyable. But I, I stayed pretty much straight and square and boring, not going to parties and being the person that turns down the joint when somebody tries to pass it to me. I've not gotten into that space ever. And so everyone I've ever met has had, I mean, I shouldn't say everyone, but so many people I've met have had a past of drinking and drugs and experimenting and all that stuff. And it is hard to relate to where they were. But I was able to explore my past to find out why I had such an aversion to it and to dig up what caused me to have the aversion. And I think that's, you know, that's my point now is what is causing you, if you're having an emotional trigger, what is causing that aversion? What is causing that, that feeling inside of you? And to me, if I'm going to look at it as a, a matter of loss, I lost the people when they were stoned or high or drunk, or I lost the feeling of security. I lost the feeling of safety. I lost the feeling of comfort. And I also lost my reality a little bit because my reality centered around these people showing up in a certain way every day of my life. And then suddenly they didn't. Suddenly they weren't them anymore. And it was scary. And it can be scary, especially for a kid going through this and seeing their parents change. That's why an alcoholic household is, is very, very hard on kids because their reality is suddenly ripped away and replaced with this altered reality. It can be very unhealthy, it can be very toxic, and a kid doesn't know how to deal with that. They don't want change. They want things to stay the same. They don't want mommy and daddy to get a divorce or mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy. They don't want their sister to go to college. They don't, you know, they want things to stay the same. You know, unless it's a really bad situation, but most of the time we want things to stay the same as we're growing up because we don't know how to handle change. We're kids. And so when these things change around us, what do we do about it? Especially when the people that we rely on most to comfort us during the change are the ones changing. This is part of the reason I was so judgmental in my marriage. She was addicted to sugar and junk food and it bothered me. I saw this addict change before my eyes. I saw her choose food over me. And of course, when I realized there was an addiction, I became very judgmental. I became very scared. It was a childhood fear that came up in me. It took me seven years to figure that out. I was judgmental from like the first month of our relationship up to the seventh year or eighth year of our relationship, which was four years into our marriage. And I finally realized that all my judgments were from a past where my stepfather became an alcoholic and he was a different person. And all I wanted was that person that I know when he's not drunk to come back to love me, to make me feel safe. I took all these fears out on my wife and she felt like I was taking away her choices. Just like I was saying to Jill, when you take away someone's choices, I don't want you to do that. That was me. I don't want you to eat junk food. I don't want you to get fat. I don't want you to, you know, I was taking away all of her choices as an adult that she could make on her own. And of course the love's going to disintegrate. Of course she's going to share less and less of herself with me. Of course she's going to get depressed because the only person that she looked to for support and love and the one that she believed that she was going to spend the rest of her life with was putting her down for the choices that she was making. Of course, that's going to erode the relationship. And it took a divorce for me to lay that final brick in the foundation of my healing to get over my judgmental ways. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm completely healed. It still comes up very, very infrequently. But my girlfriend has mentioned it every now and then. <laughs> and she'll say, you know, you have done that. I'm like, you know, it does happen. When I'm really tired, for some reason, I'm a little bit more cranky and judgmental. And I said, yeah, maybe that's still in there. Maybe I got to look at it. It does sneak up. But I said, you know, when I'm not tired, I don't even think about it. I don't even know why it's there. So there's a little bit of residue that sometimes can sneak up on us. And I think it probably does happen when we're tired and uh, we don't have so much um, filtering going on or 
Maybe it's just because we're tired, we fall into old ways and we just have to be aware of when we're the most triggered. And when we are aware of that, when we get triggered, we can ask ourselves, oh, wait, is this one of those times when I'm more triggered than not? Oh, it is. So I'm not going to say anything. You know, I'll still work on that and still try to do some healing around that. But, uh, you know, because I'm so tired now, but maybe when I get a good night's sleep tonight, I can wake up tomorrow refreshed. And let's see if I still feel the same way. And for me, it goes away. It's like it's not there. I can't even access it. It's not even there anymore. Well, maybe it's repressed. Maybe you got to look at it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> maybe it's still in there in small ways. And I am working on that for sure. But we all have something to work on. We all have something in there that probably shows its ugly head every now and then. And yeah, maybe we should work on it. So anyway, I want to thank you for joining me today. And always remember to keep an open mind so that you can step into your power and that will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.